Number 10, Gucci to the socks. Man of Musa may be the richest human to have ever walked planet Earth. The ninth emperor of the Mali Empire made his massive fortune by exploiting his country's salt and gold production. It is estimated his wealth today would be worth $400 billion US. That is a lot of money. That is a lot of shkarol. It is however difficult to place an exact number on his wealth, as this was a very long time ago, and it is difficult to separate his wealth from the actual monarch itself. However, in his travels in hopes of securing new trade deals, he wanted to show off his good faith and wealth. When he arrived in Mecca, it was time for a shopping spree, where the wealthy king spent so much gold it actually ruined the economy. Yeah, it ruined the economy of Mecca. Honestly, that's just a big Bruce Wayne play right there. Imagine spending so much money, you single-handedly raise the inflation rate in a major city. And also a few others. He, that wasn't the only place he did it, surprisingly. He also bragged at one point that gold grows like plants where he's from. Where I'm from, it's super cold and there's lots of snow. We aren't selling snow yet, right? Number nine. Bad Vlad. Vlad the Impaler is Vlad the Impaler. Okay, sure, he wasn't the wealthiest king ever and his empire wasn't that big. But listen, I called the chief last night and he said he ain't it. Vlad was best known for his creative um, punishments to say the least. Vlad was just the kind of guy who took some folks he didn't like and, you know, impaled them with large wooden or steel stakes. Vladdy did not discriminate either. While a lot of poor people did end up with the worst suppository ever, he also ended up unaliving some wealthier folk too. This one time at band camp, Vlad had two guys come visit, and when he asked them to remove their hats, as was custom in Vlad's kingdom, they refused, which in hindsight was a really bad idea, because then Vlad had their hats nailed to their heads, so that they may never remove them again. What were poor people going to do? Try and overthrow the guy who left their family members on pikes as some really weird art installation? Truth be told, I've heard too much about this guy for me to even come close to his kingdom. I'm good over here. I don't need to be anywhere near him. You stay over there, I'll be over here. It's all good. Number eight, swans. This is actually a thing, and it has been since the 12th century England. It must be kind of weird just partly being born into the royal family, becoming queen and king, and being told, uh, yes, uh, you own all of England, and you own all the swans. What? Yes, you have to attend the swan upping. What the heck is that? Well, since the 12th century, the English crown has owned all wild, mute swans in open water. Over time, they allowed other select individuals to have some swans. These privileged individuals had to mark their bird to distinguish them from royalty, a tradition which continues today. The queen only exercises the right over wild, unmarked swans near the Thames. The royal swan upping is when all of the swans on the River Thames are counted, checked for their marks, and then released. The royal swan marker is currently David Parker, and apparently it's one of the queen's favorite things to do. That's adorable. Number seven. Medieval masks. Now, to go with laws that make no sense, there are punishments that also make no sense. There is a sweet satisfaction in seeing someone with egg all over their face, I'll admit. Which is why people in the Middle Ages like to serve out punishments that dealt out a good deal of embarrassment. Which is why, for non-violent crimes, people went all out. One comical form of punishment was making criminals wear terrifying masks that were terrifying to look at. They were either paraded around town or placed in the stocks to frighten babies and passerbys. They also made crime specific badges that you had to wear for the rest of your life. One such badge was a depiction of two huge red tongues, bigger than your hand, which indicated perjury. Good luck getting a date or a job with that one. Number six, Scold's Bridal. And with the theme of odd laws, we continue with some pretty weird punishments. This one also ties into a little one we're going to talk about later, see if you can guess. Don't scroll. The Scold's Bridal was a terrifying looking contraption that was built to punish women who ran their mouths. That's right, it was a crime as a woman to have an opinion or to basically say anything anyone didn't like. They were largely designed to humiliate women who wore them, not to inflict any horrid pain, but there was a little bit. Just the shame though, that was the big thing. The bridles would be strapped onto the head with bits in the mouth like horses. The bits had spikes so it did hurt a little, but this would prevent the wearer from speaking. They were expected to parade around in this medieval headwear for 12 hours so that they would learn their lesson. Number 5. Witchcraft All the way back in 1542, the UK Parliament passed the Witchcraft Act which condemned anyone who practiced the art to death. It was repealed five years later, then reinstated with flair in 1562, meaning they added more oomph 
to it. This led to many women being sentenced to gruesome interrogations, trials, and death punishments such as burning at the stake. How does one know that someone was a witch? Well, point one, they look like one to you. Two, if you threw a hog-tied woman into a pond and she floated, she was a witch. Number three, you're a woman and financially independent. Number four, you're old. Honestly, the list goes on. Anyone could be accused of being a witch. If someone wanted an easy way to get rid of you, they could just whisper in someone's ear that you bewitched them when they were dreaming. Number four, failure to entertain. Today, if a comedian doesn't make us laugh or we don't enjoy a TV show, we just change the channel. But back in medieval times, failure to entertain the king or queen could result in your death. Nicholas Ferial was one of the most famous jesters in history, for instance, known as Tribule. He entertained King Louis XII and Francis I in France during the 1400s. He was born with a smaller head and brain than other children, which affected his neurological and physical appearance. The king seemed to be amused by this, and so he served as his jester. He wasn't academically smart, but boy was he witty. But sometimes his wit took him too far. This got him eventually into trouble, and Francis I decided to have him executed. Why he didn't just fire him and kick him out in the first place, no idea. He must have said something that really towed the line. But everything was extreme back then, keep in mind. But the king asked him, how would he like to die? And Tribule cleverly replied, old age. This broke the king's foul mood because damn it was a good joke and had him exiled from the realm instead. But damn, he cut it close. Number three, no more minced pies. This one should make some of our British fans gasp or run for a builder's tea and a mince meat pie to clutch it close to their heart. But rest assured, it was only on one Christmas day that eating mince pies was illegal, and that was on December 25th, 1644. On that year, it was legally mandated because the celebration fell on a legally mandated day of fasting. However, the pies themselves were seen as a symbol of a moral excess of Christmas season. Further legislation was proposed in 1656 to clamp down down on an immoral and lush Christmas traditions like and including the mincemeat pie. England was currently under the rule of Oliver Cromwell who was just the worst and he was very religious and just wanted everyone to behave and it was part of his effort to tackle gluttony. But when Charles became king people stopped going after holiday treats and mince pies were safe. Once again. Number two, a beached whale. So, considering poaching was illegal in the king's forest, it only makes sense that they would try to make it the same for the sea. Back then, they really ate everything they could get their hands on, from lamprey to goose to porpoise, and now whale. Whales were seen as a royal fish, and if one washed up on shore, they automatically became the property of the royals in charge. The law was passed by Edward II in 1324 because he just loved whales. He decreed that all whales, sturgeons, dolphins, and porpoises caught within 5k of shore were considered royal fish. Their meat and oil fetched a lot of money at the markets and the rich liked to covet it for their own so it was for selfish reasons that he made this rule. But funny enough, the law has never been repealed and you need to ask Queen Liz for permission to sell it, though I doubt she'd say no. Number one, animal trials. So it turns out that not only were humans punished if they did something illegal, it was also animals as well. In medieval times apparently it was a regular thing to put animals on the stand. Everything from hogs, beetles, rats, mice, cockerels, you name it, absolute crap. Craziness. In the 14th century, local people even prosecuted Spanish flies. Flies! They have no control. They don't even know what they're doing. Spanish flies were dangerous to livestock and would ruin vegetation. Needless to say, they weren't well liked. So they were appointed a lawyer and given great dignity in court, though the verdict was obviously not favorable because they couldn't speak for themselves. They were condemned and banished from a plot of land. It was believed that animals who committed a crime were possessed by the devil, and to let them go unpunished would give the devil permission to take over human affairs. So they would like literally hang pigs by nooses to punish them. Did the flies actually ever come back? Uh, probably, but at least the humans felt better about it. Number 10, farming. In a world with a lack of food, not because I ate it all, which is honestly a good reason, peasantry had to work on their farms, not only to feed the rich, but also themselves. So if the men in your household are ill or sick, then that means it's rivet rosy time. Or farming friend time, whatever you want to call it. I don't need to tell any farmer out there how tough their job can be. Being a medieval woman farmer, that's tough. Also, they probably weren't allowed to wear clothing that was more suitable for plowing fields. And of course, there's a woman trying to do a man's job. How dare she? People just should have let them be. There's a good chance the crops wouldn't make it either. A green thumb would have come in very handy. A tough job nonetheless. Number 9. Beer Maiden 
This one goes out to any woman who's ever had the pleasure of working at a certain restaurant that's fixated on women's chests. You know the one I'm talking about. Or any woman who had the absolute pleasure of working at a golf course clubhouse. Keep your mitts to yourself, you filthy animals. I can't imagine the bar maidens of yieldy times had better luck. There really aren't a lot of laws to protect them either. But basically, they helped serve ale in the taverns and inns, which brought in all kinds of unsavory types. Mind you, it's not as bad as it would be in Skyrim or you know other fantasy RPGs, but it's still a sour bunch. Sometimes there were just barrels of ale and the maiden's job was to simply just keep filling the tankards and handing them out. I'm sure she was well respected and not even once ever had her personal space infringed upon, right? Of course not, no. Number eight, fire. Can't talk about medieval punishments without mentioning this witchy classic. Commonly practiced in Babylonia and ancient Israel, then later on in Europe with the classic witch hunts, burning at the stake didn't come from churches, like many believe. They didn't call the shots there at all. That was mainly how small towns settled local beef. Yeah, by burning at the stake, instead of just like a fist fight at the park. Burning at the stake came in full swing way back in 1431 in France. French disbelievers like Joan of Arc, they were burned at the stake. It was crazy that they actually did this as a form of punishment. This is one of the worst medieval punishments. And believe me, there's a little bit of a silver lining here. It was quicker than most. Sometimes. Gunpowder was sometimes used so that the burning and stuff would be much faster and brighter and louder and much more horrible. A lot worse on paper, but a lot faster. So honestly, I think it's better. History is insane. Another red hot punishment used in medieval times was when the accused had to hold a red hot iron bar and then walk a few steps with it. A red hot iron bar, your hands were literally toast at that point. Here's where it gets even worse though. Three days later, the accused would come back to the court and then when the bandages were removed, if their hands were healing, they started to heal, they were deemed innocent. They were on the path to goodness and whatever. If their hands were still in horrible condition from say, I don't know, holding a red hot iron bar, then they were pronounced guilty. That's how the courts worked back then. Number seven, the rack. On to something not so hot and fast, but rather dull and slow, the rack is surprisingly well known. It was originally introduced to the Tower of London around 1420. The Duke of Exeter referred to this device as his daughter. What a weirdo. It's like guys who call their car like she. It's like, okay, just a little bit too close to your automobile, man. Relax. It was an open bed frame type device where your ankles were tied at the bottom and your hands were tied at the top. Already we're off to a horrible start. It was horizontal as well and sometimes it was up. It was, it was all bad. It would just leave you hanging by these ropes and these ropes were slowly tightened more and more, obviously causing some problems to muscles and joints that were, you know, holding things in place. This was done to extract information. This is also one of the worst things I've heard. Even getting tickled like this would be horrible. I couldn't even imagine. I make jokes because I'm uncomfortable, honestly. Hit that thumbs up to spread some good vibes because we're not even halfway done, folks. Number six, molten metal. This was another form of cow Capital punishment, and if you've seen Game of Thrones, it'll ring a familiar bell. A few of these do, actually. Yikes. Metal would be heated up in a cauldron for a long, long time to the point where it was liquid. It was molten metal, just a soup of minerals. Look, we said this video wasn't for the faint hearted, and here at Bumblebee, we like to keep that promise. They would then pour the molten metal on your head, or more commonly known, this would they pour it down the throat of the accused. Obviously, it wasn't done as a method to extract information, it was done to brutally end someone's life. Because they're not talking after that, of course. Execution by molten metal was supposedly done to a wealthy Roman general, Marcus Licinius Crassus, back in ancient times. The metal would burn your muscles and skin, literally cooking it, and then after a few moments, it would harden. Bad, bad, not good. Number five keel hauling. Not to be confused with kegels, keel hauling was reserved for the worst of the worst at sea. This was used by pirates for sailors who disobeyed orders and all that jazz. The victim would be suspended by a rope with rocks or weights around their ankles, then they're lowered to the keel of the ship where all the sharp barnacles live. After so long, these ships are so old, it's just piled on layers and layers of barnacles. Then they would get dragged all along them with the water and everything. Water plus pain, it's a lot. It's a deadly combination. Anything to do with barnacles in the sea, no chance. I'll literally tell you anything, Blackbeard. Anything. Number four, solitary confinement. 
This is a kind of punishment that still exists in our modern society, but it can truly be one of the worst punishments out there because of the type of psychological distress that it causes. We were all just in a pandemic for so long. We got so bored and we had Netflix and iPads and I whatevers. I can't even imagine this back in the day. Basically, it's a prisoner living in a single cell with little to no contact with anybody else. Not even like a guard or anything rattling keys like in the old times. It was just nothing. No one would even check on them. There are many stories about people being locked up for so long they forget about their families. And some people have gone away to solitary confinement for so long that once they're out, they just forget how to speak, really. They forget how to be a human and interact in the real world. Solitary confinement and the negative effects that it has on a person is becoming a wider topic of conversation because of the effects on a person's mental well-being, and it's a topic for a lot of human rights organizations. Back in medieval times, solitary confinement was literally just a room made of stones. It was pitch black, freezing cold, you were tucked away below some janky castle, and most of the time you weren't really alone. In the dark, nibbling away way your little piggies were, number three, rats. Another Game of Thrones classic. If you're a rat person, I know there's a lot of people who do tricks with their pet rat. That's cool, but maybe cover Stuart Little's eyes for this one. Rats as a medieval punishment, where do I even start? Okay, this one was a punishment for the rats at the same time. What was once called a rat trap involved a man or woman being tied down to something and then a metal enclosure would be strapped down to their chest or their stomach. Now inside this metal enclosure, there's rats, which are also just loose walking around and the person can feel them, the little feet walking around in their skin. And this is when the person instilling the punishment begins heating the other end of the metal enclosure Historically, it was hot coals that were usually placed on top or there's a fire underneath, which quickly creates a hot environment for the rats inside. From there, the rats begin frantically searching for a way out, but because it's made of metal and they can't bite through that, they find your skin and then that they can obviously bite through. So you can paint the picture in your head. It's disgusting. Number two, the breaking wheel. The breaking wheel is literally just a large disc, a pirate ship wheel almost just lying there where somebody is then tied to it and everybody else just hammers them and beats the shit out of them over and over. But of course, since we're talking about medieval times, everything has to be a show and whatnot. So once the accused was beaten and then presumed dead, the wheel would lift up and turn just to show everybody what's up. Another way to use the breaking wheel, yep, there was more than one, again, creative folks back then, they would tie a person to the wheel and then continue to rotate it and then all the ropes below would get tighter and tighter and twist. Kind of like the rack, but with a literal twist. And finally coming in at number one, the brazen bull. This one takes the rat's problem and then makes it a you problem. Out of all the ones on this list, the brazen bull is the last one that I would do. Straight up haunting. It's also been referred to as a Sicilian bull, and basically, it's not too complex. There is a bronze sculpture, often in the shape of, you guessed it, a bull. But in medieval times, it was just a big, closed cauldron. And usually, it was large enough to fit a person inside. Yeah, this was in a Saw movie, too, I believe. That's how you know it's a good one, when it's in the movie Saw. So once the person was locked inside or it was leaned over so they couldn't get out, a fire would then be set underneath this bull and then you can probably figure out the rest in your head. They would even engineer the bull so that when somebody screamed, it sounded like a bull's roar. How fun is that? How fun is history? I'm learning so much about history that's fun on Bumblebee. Okay, number 10, location, location, location. So first off, let's begin at the very foundation as to why medieval castles were built in the first place. And the biggest hint lies in where they were built. From the 11th century onwards, medieval castles were built for a few reasons. One, to demonstrate wealth. Two, provide a place of defense and retreat. And thirdly, to defend important passageways and landways. Oh, and uh, it was a nice place to live. But specifically because of the last few reasons, where a castle was built really, really mattered. Some were built by the sea to have a strong advantage over naval attacks, or they were built on hilltops just like you see in the movies. The more they could see, the better the chance they had of anticipating the enemy's attack. But even still, some castles took this idea to the extreme, such as Castle Monte Titano, which literally looks like it's about to fall off of a cliff any moment, or Brzezinski Castle, which was built into the side of a cliff face and is only partially visible from the outside. This would definitely make it difficult for anyone to attack the fortress given the rough terrain, but still, like, how did they even build that? How did you even build it? I don't even know. Just the talent, pure talent. Number nine, helmeted cock. No. 
I'm not talking about what you think I'm talking about. Think about how much entertainment you consume on a daily basis. You're watching me right now, scrolling on TikTok, Instagram, movies, Netflix, whatever you wanna do. The desire for entertainment is strong in humanity, so medieval nobles found ways to insert the funnies into everything they could, even food. Helmet and cock was one such entertaining delicacy that delighted all of the guests behind the castle walls. It was essentially a rooster stitched to a pig and then roasted. Another game they used to play with their food was live frog and chicken. They would put live frogs into pie shells so that when someone cut into it, all these frogs would just ribbit about the dinner table. Hilarity! And then live chicken was significantly darker. They pluck a live chicken in boiling water in front of the guests, like in a jacuzzi, and when it passed out, they glaze it to look like it was cooked. Then they would lay it on the table, and when the chicken finally came to, it would bound up and down the table to the delight of the guests. This poor chicken who's like frantically being like, where the heck are my feathers? I'm naked! Just awful. Weird times. Weird, weird times. What else were they gonna do? At number eight, training. When you picture what it would look like to see squires training, what do you imagine? Do you picture kids fighting with wooden swords or practicing how to put on armor? Well, you can put that out of your mind because that image is more sunshine and rainbows than what actually went on because training to be a knight was a very grueling process. When a page graduated to become a squire, they then had to master the seven points of agility. The seven points of agility were sort of like sports that would help the squires become good knights. They had to master shooting, fencing, wrestling, riding horses, swimming and diving, climbing, long jumping, and tournament sports like jousting and dancing. Yes, that is more than seven, but let's just agree that medieval math was flawed and not think about it too hard. Other than the physical skills that they had to master, squires also had to learn how to recite poetry, hunt, play chess, and impress the ladies because even though they were going to be slaying people on the battlefield, they still needed to be able to win a woman's heart. Unfortunately, even with all of this training, many young knights died in their first battles, but at least they tried their best, right? At number seven, too much poop. Here's a real downside to being a knight in the medieval era. While we've been taught that knights were these amazing, brave, chivalrous men that would rescue a princess and live happily ever after, the reality is that they were actually a bunch of dudes on a muddy battlefield with poor hygiene that were literally pooping themselves to death. Many knights who embarked on crusades had a lot of parasites and diseases, and one illness that proved most problematic was dysentery. Dysentery is an illness that basically causes super poops due to a parasite. So these knights were out trying to win back the holy lands while their tum tums were throwing up gang signs getting mad rumbly on the battlefield. It is believed that these knights contracted dysentery through drinking tainted water, and because medicine was basically a myth at this point, once you contracted dysentery, you could basically kiss your life goodbye and your stomach contents goodbye. The most famous case of death by butt explosion was from the Seventh Crusade, where Louis IX had contracted dysentery and had his pants cut because he was tired of having to pull them down every time he felt a rumbly in his tumbly. This all sounds like such a horrible way to go and a serious downside to being a knight. At number six, armor. We all have a pretty good idea of what knights looked like, right? The shiny metal armor, the chain mail and helmet. Well, as cool as they may have looked, the armor that knights wore was actually pretty impractical when it came to agility because there was just no way you could move very easily when wearing it. These knights had to carry around a lot of weight. Hollywood made us believe that swords that knights used were incredibly heavy, but in reality they only weighed about 3-5 to five pounds. Yeah, they were pretty hefty, but nowhere near the kind of weight that knights were carrying on their bodies because of their armor. The average medieval suit of armor weighed between 45 and 55 pounds, and just the helmet alone weighed 4-8 to eight pounds. Knights on the battlefield had to worry about fighting, staying alive, and carrying an extra 45 pounds on them, but knights who jousted had it even worse because their armor was known to weigh twice as much as battle armor. These knights had to be very strong in order to carry that around, otherwise they would have collapsed under the weight of their gear when they got too tired to keep going. At number 5, always in danger. When knights weren't out in some kind of battlefield, they didn't just get to sit around doing nothing waiting for the next battle. They were still knights and people loved them, so they had to entertain people through tournaments. This wasn't your average tournament like when you went to a medieval times as a kid because this was way bloodier and safety was not really much of a priority. It wasn't as dangerous as going off to battle, but there was still a risk that knights had to take and sometimes it ended fatally. Tournaments would normally involve two different events, melee and jousting. We all know what jousting is though, right? It's where two knights on horseback charge at each other with lances trying to knock their opponent off their horse. 
This sport injured and even killed people in the past. In 1559, the King of France, Henry II, was killed during a jousting tournament because his opponent's lance broke apart and sent splinters into his eyes and brain. These tournaments were meant for fun and games and entertainment, but they often ended in bloodshed in some ways, so these knights always had to risk their lives even when they weren't in an active fight. At number 4, Fired. As with any kind of job, medieval knights could get fired. These days, if you get fired, you just have to find another job to fall back on, but for knights, they had it much, much worse. Knights served their kings, and so if they did anything that went against their monarch, or if they did something that the king didn't like, they could essentially be fired from being a knight, since the king is the one who made them one in the first place. What the king giveth, he could taketh away, pretty much. When a knight was fired, the king would start by hacking off the knight's spurs, then they would break their sword, then they would burn the knight's coat of arms, and hang their shield upside down for the entire kingdom to see, because these people really liked public humiliation. And if you thought that was enough, just you wait, because on top of the spurs and the sword and the shield, they would also execute the knight for good measure, so really, you never ever want to get fired back then, because it would really end badly for you. At number 3, Burial. For medieval knights, dying was just part of the job. When someone became a knight, they knew that this was a risk that they were going to have to take. And for some knights, they worried about where they would be buried, because it had to be in the right spot, otherwise they wouldn't go to heaven. When a knight died in battle, their body had to be buried in the right kind of dirt, and that was the consecrated dirt of a church graveyard. To solve this problem for young knights, when they were knighted, they would also be given a burial plot in a church graveyard, so they knew that they were guaranteed a spot in heaven when they died. This, however, created a bit of a loophole for anyone wanting to get a one-way ticket to heaven, because even older knights who enlisted later in life would be able to get buried beneath a stone effigy in a church and be able to go to heaven even if they really never did all that churchy stuff beforehand. At number 2, Yummy People. As you could probably imagine, for medieval knights, desperate times called for desperate measures. Oftentimes during battles, supplies would run out and knights would be left dealing with starvation on top of everything else that they were going through. This proved to be a huge problem during the crusades because after supplies and food started to run out, people got desperate and started seeing other people as snacks if you know what I mean. Some of the poorest crusaders resorted to eating people to get them through their journey to take back the holy lands and as you can imagine, it was a pretty gory sight to see. Knights back then recalled seeing enemy forces on spits and dismembered people just laying around in plain view. It was rough being a knight back then and the amount of shortcuts and strategies people came up with just to survive got real dark real fast. And finally at number 1, dehydration. On top of not having enough to eat, many knights from the crusades also didn't have anything to drink and many of them died of dehydration. Dehydration was especially deadly during heat waves. At one point things got so bad for knights embarking on their holy war that 500 knights died of dehydration in just one summer back in 1097. Since it was such a terrible way to go, people started weaponizing dehydration so to speak. This happened when the Sultan Saladin lured the enemy forces away from their water source and set fire to the grass around the enemy troops, causing them to overheat. Because they couldn't drink anything and because of the intense heat, the troops got too weak to fight back and then they were defeated by Saladin. The elements were so intense that these knights really had it bad. Weaponizing dehydration, that is a super messed up thing to do, but back then, people were ruthless. Kicking off the list at number 10, Together at Last. Remember when you were a kid and your mom would bump into their friend at the grocery store? That was the worst. While they caught up for what seemed like hours, you were bored out of your mind just staring at like bags of rice and cleaning detergent. That's when the shrew's fiddle comes in. Two women would be locked together, hands included, and face each other. All because they were too loud or they were arguing. These were used in the Middle Ages, most commonly in Germany and Austria, and the contraption would have three holes, one for each wrist and the third for your neck. Now sometimes they would attach a bell to these shrew's fiddles to alert the town that the victim was walking by, you know, in order to talk smack, maybe huck a tomato or two. But the double fiddle, that was the worst. You weren't released until the argument had settled. Some families have an argument shirt where they put the two little siblings in and they can't take the shirt off until they get along. This is like a horrible medieval ages version of that. Much, much more uncomfortable. Not made of cotton. Or funny. Just bad. Just all bad. Number nine, point blank period. All right, babes, let's try not to shudder, but let's talk about periods for a second. 
Aunt Flo, the Red Sea, Shark Week. So many names to describe a pretty sucky time for people who get their period, right? Well, it might suck these days, but back in the medieval times, it was a hell of a lot worse. They just didn't have the same kinds of resources that we have today, so a lot of people had to use their noodle to figure out how to get by. Period products weren't really a thing back then, so people had to get creative. They would use rags or other linens to fashion a pad, but underwear also wasn't really all that popular yet, so they had to find a way to keep things in place. They would also sometimes fashion a makeshift medieval tampon of sorts where they would wrap cotton fabric around a twig and shove it up their hoo-ha. Sounds mighty uncomfortable if you ask me. Some people would also seek out bog moss because it was remarkably absorbent, so they would make their period products out of that sometimes too. This type of moss garnered the name blood moss because of its use in treating wounds and use in period products. For other people who just couldn't create these kinds of things, they would just resort to wearing red the whole time, so everything just kind of blended in. Menstruation, but make it fashion. Number eight, a tanner. Even for a medieval peasant who never washed or cleaned themselves and literally lived in filth, this was a dirty job. Women were more commonly found in household chores or as milkmaids, barmaids, weavers, artisans, and tenant farmers. This job may have fallen mostly to men, and it was a rough one. I'll tell you. Men would rather go to war than do this job. You had to get skins from a butcher, along with the grime that covered it, which was mostly manure and blood. Then you had to trim the skins and get rid of all the hair. To do this, they had to let the hair follicles rot by sprinkling it with urine or soak it in a wood, ash, and lime solution. Can you tell which one was cheaper? Then they'd scrape off the hair and any skin before washing it again in pigeon droppings or dog poo to remove the lime and make it softer and more flexible. You. Or the craftsmen might use fermented barley or rye with stale beer or urine, again, as an additive. This could take up to three months. Three months plus longer as there was more rinsing and stretching until it could be used. Leather was a crucial resource, so though dirty, it was a really necessary job, but oh my god. No thank you. Number seven, being a knight. Being a knight, obviously it sounds cool. They have the sword, they have the horse, the flowing hair. They're saving the damsel in distress, all that jazz that you picture in your head. It actually sucked being a knight, a lot. First of all, chain mail. You know how heavy chain mail is alone? It's like 55 pounds, and that was underneath all of your armor. No way I could climb up on a horse wearing armor or chain mail. My knees would buckle, no thank you. Being a knight is something that starts when you're seven years old as well. You would be given to a noble to learn for seven years, and then at age 14, you would become a squire. A knight's intern, not an ideal job to have when you're 14, but okay. But if you stick it out for just seven more years, then you become a knight. And then you can get your chest blown off jousting. Neat. All that time just to get rocked by another bigger dude on a bigger horse. No, just no for me. Number six, death by anything but mostly violence. Life in medieval times was considered basically brutal and short. If it wasn't the plague, it was a cold. If it wasn't disease, it was the weather. If it wasn't the weather, it was famine. If it wasn't famine, it was violence everywhere else. It was a damn miracle if you survived childhood. If you had to pick any other time in history to live, like you couldn't live in this one, Taylor asked me this earlier and I had a response, but it definitely wasn't this time. Literally block this time period from your mind. Between 1330 to 1479, men could expect to die nine years sooner than their female counterparts. The reason was violence against men by other men. But the biggest factor that made especially men's lives so short was the violence, as I mentioned. Think about it. It was men who were often called to war with only their farming tools, or if they were proper soldiers, they would have had more. But they were called off to do jobs that literally required them to kill or be killed. Homicide levels in medieval England were around 10 times higher than they are today. This isn't to say at all that women were excluded from this, they were mostly the victims of this violence, but there was a culture around men that expected them to take part in violence to the extreme. From drunken brawls, to duels, to playful sword fights gone wrong, torment, there was a lot going on. Male gangs were responsible for most of the mayhem as they were bolstered with the need to prove themselves, but also if you were about 
were to get mugged in an alleyway and somebody wanted to fight you, which was very likely because everyone was on edge, it was good to have backup. Number five, rat catcher. As the name hints towards, rat catchers are one of the worst jobs you can have in and around a castle. It's an important role, of course, like being a fool or a literal walking, talking toilet, which I'll get into later, but there needs to be a chasseur de rats. Chasseur de rats, I'm just gonna start calling myself that. Back in those times, rats and mice were the leading source of spreading disease. They didn't have city buses or you know, people walking around throwing bottles. And with these castles being big and dark, they were probably full of rats. Black rats were a common household problem, yuck. So in comes the well-respected rat catcher. These guys would sometimes try and use spells to get rid of rats. Wouldn't work really too well, but more often than not, that didn't work, so poison powders were the main trick of the trade. The most famous you probably heard of is the Pied Piper. He visited Germany, he arrived in the small town, and rumor has it this guy used a flute to drive all the rats just into the river. He just, hmm. He does a musical performance and then exterminates all of your pests. If anything, he should be getting a bonus, but rather the town insists they weren't even gonna pay him, so he used his flute to make everybody just go away and leave the town forever. What an OG. He's like, you don't wanna pay me? No sweat. <gasps> Number four, the Crusades. Just imagine this, thick, heavy metal armor reflecting the heat from the sun back against you as you chug along the desert. Despite being in the holy land, this certainly sounds like hell. As I mentioned earlier, men were expected to go to war when called, even if they had no training or skill and like maybe knew how to use a toothpick but had no idea what a sword was. For many, it was a death sentence and the first crusades were particularly brutal um, because you weren't only being called to war because of, you know, honor, but you were being called to war because it was a religious thing. Getting there was awful in the first place, you might not even make the voyage. Then marches through the desert were long and hot with soldiers constantly at odds with starvation, dehydration, disease, infection, the elements, and then of course, a spontaneous attack from the enemy. So like you're exhausted and all of a sudden you have to be like, huh, fighting somebody to save your life. There are even stories of some of them boiling shoe leather to eat it because they had nothing else. And after what we know of tanning, ugh, many crusaders justified their suffering as a part of the spiritual journey. So if you did fall ill to disease, you were just kind of left by the side of the road to die alone. Number three, groom of the stool. Nowadays, assistants grab your coffee for you, maybe they answer some phone calls, keep the business running while you're off doing your other business stuff. Assistants are vital. The groom of the stool was quite vital when it came to the king. Created by King Henry VIII, the role was to assist the king's bowel movements. Yeah, you had just a box with you that you carried at all times, little opening lid, smelled horrible, and you would literally follow the king until he needed to use you. Yeah, porta potties weren't a thing, and there's no way you're going to catch a king shitting in the woods. In fact, you won't even catch a king wiping his own behind. That was also reserved for the groom of the stool. Lucky you. In this stool, you would have water, towels, a wash bowl, the whole setup, and you're probably thinking, Taylor, which poor soul had to be stuck with this role? What must you have done to deserve such a punishment? Well, this is the job you wanted, really. Only sons of noblemen could take on this role, and in doing so, they also gained access to every room, tons of nice clothes, any bedchamber furnishings, and of course, a high pay, yeah. I would say this is the craziest job on this list, but it's really not. Number two, the executioner. A man named Franz Schmidt meticulously chronicled his life as an executioner in detail. And well, as you can guess, it's not, it's not a fun one, but there was a lot of humanity behind it too. He had to start practicing on pumpkins at first, then graduate to live animals, and then humans. Who would choose a role like this? Well, though legally the role wasn't hereditary, it pretty much was by expectation and blood. The job was passed from eldest son to eldest son with other sons being trained to fill vacancies. Daughters of executioners married sons of executioners, so the position would continue. As most people saw this as a pretty undesirable profession, it was difficult to keep anyone at their post, so the job fell to the men who inherited the axe, as it were. So. Not legally, but it was. This cycle of executioners created something called executioner dynasties across Europe. The existence of these dynasties meant that men were trapped in this cycle of employment and had few other opportunities to work. It also meant you had a very lonely life, as people who associated with death weren't people anyone liked to hang around. And number one, the gong farmer. 
The Gong Farmer, of course we had to end on this one as it's definitely the most crappy of the list. Medieval washrooms are just horrible. They're not really a thing. They didn't have the sanitation techniques that we have today. Stuff would often pile up within the castle walls and over time it would smell worse and worse. You can only imagine. The Rat Trapper would be around this area too, I'm assuming. So maybe they would see each other and fist bump and be like, hey, our jobs suck, nice, let's do it, get that bread. So these respected gong farmers, they would come in and take the bad stuff away from the castle. They were crap commuters, essentially. These cesspits were usually in the bottom of the castle, the lowest level, because you know how gravity and things work. These guys would go in and dig through years of yuck piles of it just moving all day long back and forth out of the castle. They too were paid well, really well obviously, but a lot of these gong farmers got sick. A good number of them just wouldn't come out of those pits. Pretty horrible, right? And on top of that, people didn't like talking to them. Their job wasn't cool like the guy who takes heads. Head and shoulders also didn't exist back then. They didn't smell the best. They were often just kind of eh, and they crossed the street. It was sad. It was all bad. Number 10, playing football. Considering football, soccer for my fellow North Americans, it's basically a religion in England. It's hard to imagine them ever having a world without it. But the football they played back in the day had far less rules and was a lot rougher on the players and the infrastructure. It could have an infinite number of players and could take part across an entire village. The goals were sometimes set miles apart and the game would often be used to settle disputes. So soon, actual brawls of tumbling, angry bodies would muck about with each other. But hey, according to the rules, you had to do everything you could to win. So if that meant punching a guy out or destroying a fruit cart, that's what you did. It also wasn't strictly football. You could use any part of your body. But the game became so damaging that King Edward II had to put a ban on it. It was causing too much injury and property damage. He forbade the games and condemned any who disobeyed to imprisonment. You'd think he would have just forced people to play by safer rules, not ban it all together, but oh well. It's back now! Number 9, Outrageous Men's Fashion. I finally found the reason as to why men's fashion has plateaued at the suit thing. I sense a colorful change in the wind nowadays though. But the last time they went really outrageous, they ended up getting punished for it. Medieval Europe was one of the most colorful periods of men's fashion to date. Anglo-Saxon men wore tunics, trousers, leggings, and strappy leather shoes tied together with belts and girdles. Oh, but that's not all. Oh, no, that's not all. Cod pieces were introduced later on. What is a cod piece, you ask? It was a piece of flair that men used to use to advertise their endowment, as it were. As you can suspect, they got quite big. As did their shoes. The longer the shoes, the richer you appeared, and the more pronounced the cod piece, well, I think you get the point. Men who wore pointier shoes had a higher social position. Some shoes were longer, anyways. But from 1337 onwards, laws were passed to preserve decency. No one was to wear a tunic that did not cover their buttocks or genitals. Offenders were fined 20 shillings, which is around 700 pounds today, or roughly $1,400 Canadian. Number eight, the ducking stool. This next one requires so much effort as like a team. I can't believe this was a real thing. The ducking stool was made to punish women involved in sexual activities. How dare you? Shame. Men were punished too, but if we know anything about history, it was mostly women who had to put up with this shit. There was first the standard ducking stool, so women would have to sit in this chair, strapped down while sitting outside of their home, or they were carried down the street. Humiliation at its finest. The town would be like, they had sex, can you believe it? Let's take the day off work and embarrass them now. Losers, they're the losers. So stupid, so backwards. The second version of the ducking stool was essentially the same thing, only it was ducked into a river over and over and over again to cool her moderate heat. At least that's what French writer Francois Maximilien Misson says. They should cool off all those angry villagers, if anything. I don't know, dip them in the river. They're the ones burning with rage because somebody who lives over there had sex once. It's really weird. Go home. Relax. At number seven, Satan's incarnate. Back in the medieval age, women were very much oppressed and incredibly misunderstood. I mean, they thought so many women were witches, and as time went on, the criteria for diagnosing a woman with witchitis or whatever got bigger and bigger to the point where literally any woman could be accused of being a witch for the most BS reasons. Back then, people thought that women were Satan's incarnate, and so they were predisposed to sin, and therefore, they had to be witches. Logic, not quite present, but go off, I guess. There were four reasons why a woman could be considered part of the devil's posse. One, because it was believed that women are foolish and gullible, which is why they turned to magic. Two, because women are insatiable when it comes to their carnal pleasures, and so they seek out help from the devil to satiate their needs. Three, because women talk a lot and we speak lies, apparently. And four, because women are weak, and the only way we can seek revenge is by using magic powers and spells. 
Now what in the balls is this all about? I don't know. Maybe men in medieval times were just jealous that they couldn't kiki it up with the devil, or because they knew deep down that women run the world. Number six, nosy neighbor. If you were a man back in the Middle Ages and you had an affair, well, you would have to pay a fine. And then that's it. You would go back to your life. But if you're a woman, like everything else on this insane list, it was so, so much worse. Affairs happen a lot, okay? It's normal. Remember that Ashley Madison scandal back in 2015? It sucks, but also it's not surprising at all. This isn't news to us. Back in the Middle Ages, women were treated the worst for these affairs. They would take their noses off. They would literally take a woman's nose and or ears off of their face because they had an affair. Frederick II used to punish adulterers by using renotomy. That was the removal of one's nose. The whole point of this was to make the victim unattractive. Isn't that the worst thing you've ever heard? This is a real thing people did, swear to God. Thing is, nobody is running around confessing that they're cheaters. Somebody has clearly spilled the beans, so they knew what was gonna happen if they got caught, yet they would still rat each other out. Meanwhile, the guy just pays a small fee. Snitches get stitches, just saying. At number five, married young. Lots of people get married at different ages. I mean, I know people I went to high school with who are already married, and I know people who didn't get married until later in life. But in medieval times, women, or rather girls, were getting married off at very young ages. At just 12 years old, a girl would reach the age of maturity and was then entitled to marry, usually to someone her parents had already chosen for her. To me, that just sounds so unfair, right? I mean, this kid hasn't really been able to live their life, make mistakes and learn from them, and now they're expected to be a wife and soon a mother? I could never. I mean, I'm only 22, so I'm not even thinking about those prospects, but I couldn't even imagine the amount of pressure that would be on a 12 year old at the time. What's worse than just the age at which these girls got married was the treatment that they received from their husbands. Under civil law, a husband was literally allowed to physically harm his wife. In moderation, of course. It was actually a medieval tradition for husbands to quote, treat his wife as a pupil and teach her manners. As you could imagine, this made a lot of wives really mad, and so many wives offed their husbands. But things rarely got better after that because if they were caught, they would be sentenced to burn at the stake. Note to self, don't get married in medieval times. Number four, the walk of shame. We've all heard the term walk of shame at some point, but what does it really mean? And also, where did it originally come from? Well, it was originally referred to as a skimmington or rough music. I know, it doesn't mean they would blast Slipknot this whole time. This was done to wives who were bossy or overbearing. They would be forced to walk through the entire town barefoot, all those crooked, horrible stone roads, ankles just toast, it was horrible. They would also be scandally clad too because why not? Because men are making the rules, that's why. And as you guessed it, crowds would be waiting outside, all prepared to bang pans and yell horrible things at her. I guess these dudes just never had jobs. I don't know, they were just always on standby, ready to yell at a lady walking by through town, bare feet, all because she was deemed too bossy. Okay. If you're wondering who exactly is responsible for these public humiliations, um, the court. The official court. Judge Judy back in the day would be like, yes or no, did you raise your voice? Okay, case dismissed. Take your shoes off, we're done here. What a joke. At number three, ladies of the night. Sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do to get that coin, right? We all have our side hustles and dead end jobs to be able to afford rent and whatnot. And sometimes we're not exactly proud of the work that we do to make money. It was the same back in medieval times. People had to find any means to make money and for a lot of women, they used what their mama gave them to support themselves and their families. One of the more positive sides of life for women in medieval times was the fact that being a woman of the night Night was actually a recognized profession. Later on throughout the times, this profession would be deemed illegal, but in medieval times, it was as common as being a baker or something. These women were actually considered to be merchants because they sold their bodies as if it was any other sellable good. Being a woman of the night was such a common and widespread profession that nearly every town in medieval times had a brothel, even in towns with small populations. So yeah, maybe they didn't have that big of a marketplace, but they no doubt had a place where you could go Go see some quality mommy milkers. Number two, grand theft witchcraft. If you were a woman in the Middle Ages, you were accused of being a witch pretty often. They thought women communicated with the devil, like Bree mentioned earlier, just because some townsfolk with three teeth said so. Great, thanks, Abe. Good job. Good report. 
The punishment for practicing witchcraft wasn't a heavy fine like guys who cheated, but they would be burnt at the stake. This was popular in Scotland along with drowning. Those are the two big ones. Remember earlier how I said women would sometimes be dipped into a river or a pond? Well, they would also sometimes just be left there. It's called witch dipping, and depending on if she floated or sank, that's, you know, witch or not. The dumbest thing I ever heard. If you were charged with treason or witchcraft, that was the ideal punishment because it surely beats burning to death in front of an entire village. This all got out of control come the start of the 17th century with the Salem witch trials. That's when people were like, you know what, I think this is wrong. I think we should stop. Let's put this torch out. I think we're good. That's when 19 people were executed for being witches. God forbid you knew how to do bed mass in the Middle Ages. Also, that's a lot of coordination to get that many townsfolk together and be like, okay, you need this, you need this. How many people are standing here? Almost like you would use basic math to figure that out. You're a witch too. Spoiler alert, we're all witches, because we know things. I don't know, I hate this. And finally at number one, crimes of the heart. For some unknown reason, people were really out here in these streets in medieval times trying to accuse women of everything. Witchcraft was a common accusation, but the other common crime that women were often accused of was adultery. But you see, the thing is, Someone could accuse a woman of adultery even if she never had physical contact with another person. Now, how the heck does that work, you ask? Well, it depended on where these people lived. During the medieval age in the Byzantine Empire, it was considered adultery if they spent a night outside of their husbands or parents' homes. In Slavic parts of Europe, a woman could be considered guilty of infidelity for simply going to a public event. I'm pretty sure with this logic, if you even breathe in the same general vicinity of a man, then you could be accused of adultery. I mean, what the F is that up? The only bright side, I guess, is the fact that when it came down to punishments for adultery, men usually got the worst punishments in comparison to women, however, they would be accused of this crime way less often than women, so I guess in a way we still got the short end of the stick. Damn it. Kicking off the list at number 10, boiling. Whenever I get in a bath that's too hot, I think of the medieval times. I can't help it. I can't believe this was once a real thing. I get chills thinking about it. Either water or oil would be used for this ancient punishment. To die by being boiled, that was reserved for those who poisoned others. So if you have any vials of poison, toss it. Don't do it, man. Trust me. In 1531, the time King Henry VIII was running the show, they made boiling a capital punishment. So poisoning somebody back then was equal to treason. Therefore, it was agreed you should be boiled slowly in front of of like a room full of people. I would say that's the worst, but I know what's also to come on this list. Number nine, water. Taking a step away from the worst physical thing one could possibly go through, let's take a look at how far the mind will go before it too breaks. Sensory deprivation is still around today. In fact, there's many who pay for it. Yeah, they lie in a dark tub full of salt, then they float and listen to Childish Gambino. It's a magical experience. Your senses are powerful, especially combined with water. So this dripping machine, this old water punishment, that was just all bad. You had ice cold water dripping on your forehead and your face over and over for hours and hours. Drops would be at different random time so you can predict it as well. My toes are wiggling while I'm talking about this. This is making me anxious right now. In medieval times, they would tie you down and then using a horn, a big ass funnel, they would pour nine pints of water down into your, down your, down your throat. So water is horrible in many ways. Number eight, Return of the Mac. Okay, so you guys know Rome, right? Beautiful ancient city, monuments, aqueducts, a big scary army with red brooms on top of their heads for some reason. Mamma mia, it's beautiful. But it didn't last forever. After many years of conquest and living well, it eventually decayed and sort of split in half with the west and east. The east becoming known as the Byzantine Empire, which it honestly did pretty well for itself too. This includes the adventures of Basil II. He's nicknamed the Bulger Slayer. For video games out there, Doom Slayer is a big dude in green armor that does what exactly? slays demons. So that means Basil slays Bulgars. Huh? Yeah, real nice dude. With his financial might and power, he was able to conquer Bulgaria, which lasted a long time actually. And by the time of his death, Basil was the wealthiest man in Byzantine. A classic tale of a man in charge exploiting and pillaging those less fortunate. Number 7. Off with his belly. King Henry VIII was a guy known for a few shady things. Removing your wife's head because you want a new wife isn't exactly the nicest way to go about divorce. I could think of some nasty other stuff too. I know what the f I'm saying. I think what was rather more interesting, however, was the king's diet and the quality of life divide between royalty and peasants. 
especially compared to the average person at the time. Sure, he was the king, but the list of foods and menus that were available to him were crazy, even by today's standards, almost rivaling the wealthy of today. His banquets would often include pork, chicken, fish, goose, beef, fruit, bread, and desserts galore. Extravagant desserts with beautiful designs. And of course, you gotta have some wine to wash that all down with. Which, funny enough, might have made them healthier to drink wine since water purification at the time wasn't so great. It is said he was consuming way more than the average person's calorie intake. Also, not to mention his food was fresh, or as fresh as it could be for the time. And if it wasn't, it was seasoned and preserved with very expensive spices from the far reaches of the globe. Spices that no normal person can get their hands on. The average person may not have been starving, but the quality of food and lack of fresh proteins show you what the almighty gold coin can do. Could someone please pass me the turkey? Number 6. The Cowardly Lion Richard I was the king of England for a decent amount of time, but didn't spend a lot of time of it in England. He spent most of his time raising taxes so he could fund his international warmongering. After all, that's kind of what history is about. History doesn't usually remember the times we were super friendly and got along. Which brings us to the Crusades! After recapturing Acre in 1191, his enemy Saladin was considering options of what to do next, and also considering uh, prisoner swaps, which actually was common for the time. Sadly, Saladin may have been taken too long, or may have been planning a re-retake of the city, because Richard had waited too long. Not sure what Saladin was up to, he took prisoners from Acre who were poor civilians and soldiers up onto a nearby hill in full view of Saladin and slaughtered 3,000 people. He's remembered for being Richard the Lionheart for his bravery. All I'm saying is that it's not very brave to kill innocent poor civilians. War as hell, I guess. Number 5. Nothing is true. Everything is permitted. The Medici family didn't exactly live around the medieval times, but fairly close. That being said, the family is something similar to the Kardashians of today. No, not a hit reality show based around wealthy women who sit around their mansion all day looking for a good verbal argument. No, but rather a well-known family who had extreme wealth and as time went on gained a lot more wealth and power. The Medici got their wealth by being successful bankers. And when you got money, you got power. And they owned a lot of property and had clients in multiple cities. Some family members would later become royalty like Catherine de' Medici, and even more powerful by some family members becoming next to the Lord himself as the Pope. Which if you're into that sort of thing, you would know how serious that position really is. What I'm getting at is, you don't get that powerful without breaking a few eggs. They use money and power to manipulate and they got their way. Number 4. Diaper Sniper All right, this one's messed up, but that's just how things were. Marriage is a beautiful matrimony between two loving people that has a harmonious, lasting lifetime. Tell that to people in divorce court and see where that gets you. While we may marry for love today, things were a little bit different back in the oldie times. Marriage was oftentimes a business opportunity, or a peace treaty of sorts, and other versions of marriage would have you on a certain dateline show with Chris Hansen. I'm talking about girls getting married at the old refined age of 12. Yuck. It's just how it was. At the time, that was considered the age of maturity, but I mean, if you only live until you're 35, it kind of makes sense, I guess. While most of these cases are from poor people, at the end of the day, they were women and simply could not own business and property that men could. So it's in the best interest that a wealthy man marries a poor girl. Gotta do what you gotta do, I guess. Number three, dyslexia for cure found. I don't know about you guys, but sometimes reading can be really hard. You've seen my blooper reel. I mean, I went to school, I got my grade 10, and that's really cool. Maybe soon I'll be able to go to college and get my PFD. But I wasn't a big fan of school. I just like to hang out with my friends. But then again, I did have the opportunity to attend school. The same cannot be said for poor peasants in the medieval age. Some wealthy kings would go as far as to ban the serfs from learning to read. Wouldn't want your population to be too smart. They might overthrow you after all. And sorry, ladies, that means you aren't going either. Schools were boys clubs. No girls allowed. The richest of families could have their son sent off to be a squire and eventually enter knightship for their royal throne. But this was for the very rich. I can't help but think that I would look good in all that metal armor though. Give me a sword, a shield, noble steed. I'm assuming the wealthy would let me go to school. Please sir, could I learn to read? Number 2. Do you require a bowel movement, sir? Kings will be kings, and sometimes they do some things that shouldn't be things. Meet the royal groom of the stool, a man who must follow the king around with a ye olde porta potty, or really just a bowl, where he would be ready to assist the royal in a release of his bowels. 
Originally created by King Henry VIII, the groom's job was to assist the king with a box to relieve himself, also carrying towels and water, even monitoring the outcome of such daily events. After all, he's the king, gotta keep tabs on his diet. It's also rumored that the kings may have even required assistance in hygiene after the fact. Which, I mean, come on, I know we all need help sometimes, but that's a tad much. With all the disease and not hand washing at the time, I'm not really sure anyone ate food ever again. Ooh. Number 1. Dead End Job Wiping a royal bum is tough, but cleaving a man's head from his body kinda sucks too. The rich uphold the law and that means when it's time for the death penalty, somebody's gotta do it. Somebody with less money and somebody who might not have a choice as professional unalivers at the time often were handed down the blood soaked acts of their kin. On one hand, you have law and order that is respected. On the other hand, you have a profession that sees law and order through, but is not that well respected. Makes sense that the job kind of sucks though. Unalivers often had to practice their skills and eventually worked their way up to the real McCoy. Practicing on pumpkins, animals, and eventually criminals. If they got it wrong, i.e. too many swings of the axe, people would rush and attack their unaliver. Despite what movies and cartoons may make you think, these people did have empathy for what they were doing, and because of their social status, a lot of them live lonely lives. Number 10. Pressure to perform. In the Middle Ages, either partner in a marriage was entitled to coitus with their partners under any circumstances. It was called the marriage rite. This went both ways, and unless you were passionately in love with your partner and straight, this could be a nightmare. It was so sacred, you could even get it on in a church, and the priest would be like, yep, go for it. Failure to perform in the bedroom or anywhere was grounds for divorce, which was a huge deal at the time. Now, the first problem here is a lack of consent, but the biggest problem for men who weren't inclined to sleep with their wives was impotency. There was no sympathy for men in these circumstances. If a wife accused her husband of this, then the couple would have to undergo a bedroom trial, where a crowd of wise elders, mainly grandmothers, aunts, and mothers, would watch the couple in their bedroom for three nights. If you were rich, this was even worse. These trials would be carried out in public in court. Yeah, that's right. The wife had to prove that the husband couldn't get it up in court. Now, he could call on women of the night to prove his prowess, if he was so inclined, but if it was proven that he couldn't, then the couple would be divorced. But the bottom line, the main point of marriage was to have children, and if there weren't any, then this failure was placed heavily on the man. Number 9. Beastly Justice I figured I would put a lighthearted one on this list. This actually made me laugh while I was researching it. Beastly Justice was when animals had to go to court. They were also put on trial, like a full trial. It's wild to look back at a night and the things they had to do for their kings and queens, but the fact that they also had to get up early and like attend these courts, royal courts, where a wild animal was taking the stand. And it actually happened in history. This would happen after an animal runs through town. It would attack people, being confused and all, as most animals are. But the townsfolk would actually believe that the devil was involved in this animal's scheme. Like these animals worked for Big Red himself. In 1457, villagers in France had to deal with six pigs who ran wild and attacked locals. They did a lot of damage, so instead of just putting the animals down or setting them free, you know, away from your town, they took them to a real trial. There was a judge, a couple prosecutors, eight witnesses, a defense attorney for the pigs, which I gotta say, we should do a list just on that person alone. What a weird job. These pigs were hung from a gallows tree. A knight had to formally hang pigs after a trial was concluded. The 1400s were a wild time. Uh, Your Honor, due to my client being a pig, um... On number eight, shotgun wedding. Marriage and weddings back in the medieval ages were practiced very differently compared to today. Back then, people started getting married and having kids very, very young. Usually, girls would be married off as soon as they hit puberty, so around the age of 12, and they would start popping out as many spawn as possible because the high infant mortality rate made it very difficult to grow a family. On top of the duty to further the population, these marriages weren't for love. Arranged marriages were the norm back then because it was mostly used to join families for status or alliances, or because your dad owed Billy from down the block a favor and he offered you to his son Billy Jr. Marriage ceremonies were also very different back then. Because marriage wasn't as big of a fuss as it is now, it didn't matter where you got married or how soon. You could get engaged in the morning and be married by lunchtime if you really wanted to. Most people didn't need permission to get married so they could hold the ceremony anywhere. Marriage ceremonies could be held in places like 
pubs, in the middle of the street, or even in bed. Because of this, it made it really hard to know who was married and to whom until the 12th century when it was declared a holy sacrament that must be observed by God. Number 7. No objections. So obviously, with a lot of people marrying willy nilly, a lot of marriages mostly made people miserable. Maybe. Enemies to Lovers is my favorite book trope, so who knows how spicy things actually got. I hate you, I love you, next day, I don't know. But the famous line, speak now or forever hold your peace, only got introduced in 1215 to try and flush out drama before they couldn't go back. In the Middle Ages, drama discovered after marriage vows were exchanged caused major problems since divorce wasn't easy or, you know, accepted. We will get to that later. For instance, Joan of Kent, who was known for marrying Edward the Black Prince and mothering Richard II, had a secret marriage when she was 12 years old. She didn't get approved. In her early teens, she was married to an aristocrat, but the secret marriage was discovered after eight years. The papal court had to overturn it and return her to her knight. He died 11 years later, and it was after that that her cousin Edward married her. Wouldn't it have been nice to know that little detail before she married the aristocrat guy? Yeah, probably. Would have saved a lot of heartbreak. Hence why the speak now or forever hold your peace was introduced. At number six, shoes. Back in the days of old, shoes were apparently a huge staple in society. They were pointy and weird and expensive and complicated and were even integrated into marriage practices. During the wedding ceremony, it was a tradition for the father of the bride to take one of the bride's shoes and give it to the groom. The groom would then tap the bride on the head with the shoe in a token of his authority. But the shoe traditions don't stop at bopping people on the head like little bunny foo foo. You know how these days there's a tradition of throwing the bouquet at weddings, and apparently whoever catches it is the next to get married? Well that tradition sort of came from the medieval tradition of throwing shoes at weddings. Instead of throwing flowers, brides would throw shoes at their bridesmaids to determine who was next to walk down the aisle. Now this whole bride throwing things idea has failed me before because I caught a bouquet once and I'm as single as ever. So so maybe someone needs to chuck a shoe at me or something this time. Please. Number five, the bedroom trial. So divorce, again, wasn't a thing. On the upside of dying early, it potentially meant that you weren't locked in a marriage for too long. If the marriage did end, it wasn't a divorce, it was an annulment, which was very expensive. A common reason this happened was due to consanguinity, which was close relations by blood or marriage, which was forbidden. Other grounds would be adultery, leprosy, and impotency. Also failure to concede to the marriage debt, which was the obligation for both spouses to engage sexually. It actually didn't matter where this happened. You had to do it even if it was in a church. It was a big deal. Enter the bedroom trial. Court cases from the 14th century show records that bedroom trials took place that would determine whether a marriage should continue. The bedroom part is exactly as it sounds. The man and the woman were placed in a bed together and were to be watched by the wise women for several nights. If over the course of the night the man's member remains of no use, i.e. impotence, then it was determined that the marriage should end. But the wise women were most likely either complete strangers or the groom's grandmother. So I doubt that would have helped with the getting it up part. Poor guys. At number four, marrying the country. If you married an entire country, does that count as polygamy? Are you technically married to everyone in the country or just the one country as a singular unit? These are the shower thoughts that I wish I could ask medieval queens, but unfortunately they died a long, long time ago along with their marriage secrets and probably some recipes for poison too. Back to this whole marrying the country idea though. Back in the medieval age, when someone became queen, they had to get married more than once. For them, it wasn't just about marrying their spouse, they also had to marry their country. This process was called consecration, and it was something that a ruler had to go through in order to be a legitimate queen. The queen would go through a symbolic marriage to the realm, complete with prayers and a blessing and a ring and a crown. It was essentially like a real wedding, except the groom was a nation of people. Sounds like a happy marriage to me. Yeah. Number three, the veil. As we have determined so far in our list, love wasn't the primary reason for marriage, especially for nobles. So as a result, there were quite a significant amount of arranged marriages. Besides the symbolism of humility and purity, it was also used as a way of disguising the bride entirely. The bride would often be wrapped from head to toe to protect her from evil spirits. This tradition goes all the way back to ancient Roman times. That's one explanation, but during arranged marriages, it was more literally used to hide the face of the bride from the groom. So if he didn't like what he saw after he literally unwrapped the package, well, too bad, she's yours now. Eventually veils progressed to being much smaller, but the tradition of revealing the bride to the husband to declare ownership remained a tradition, even to this day, kind of, except now it's more romantically idealized. Do you see Priyanka Chopra's awesome veil and that, you know the one. 
At number two, long distance marriage. You know how during the pandemic, people started having Zoom weddings? Well, in a way, people have been doing something similar since the medieval ages. Back then, a lot of weddings were simply for political reasons, and so a big ceremony was rarely needed. So when two people from different kingdoms were getting married, they didn't necessarily need to be there for the wedding. Instead, they could send proxies and have someone marry their new spouse on their behalf. This would be the legal binding of marriage, you know, the paperwork work side of things. But once both parties could finally meet in person, then they would hold a second ceremony with all the pomp and circumstance that you would expect. And yes, it still included the whole watching the consummation thing. Ew. This proxy marriage actually happened to Marie Antoinette and her brother was her proxy until she could get to the formal ceremony. So now we know that even back then you didn't have to show up on time to your own wedding and you could just get someone else to do it. Sounds a little cold to me but like I've said before, love is dead and it died a long time ago. Mic drop, thank you. Number one, last but not least and this is the most messed up, the Lord's Rite. This one is definitely the most messed up tradition and I don't even know how it was justified in the first place, like why was it even in place? Someone clearly Clearly made this happen so they could piss people off. The last thing anyone wants at their wedding is someone interfering with the wedding night. As we know, people for the most part had to observe the ceremony, but the Lord's Rite was something even more horrific. The Droit de Seigneur was a feudal rite that existed in medieval Europe that gave the Lord of the land the right to sleep with the bride on the first night of the marriage. That's right, so most often they would take the bride's virginity. Now just how often this rite was carried through is debated, but if your lord had a particular vendetta against you, it wouldn't be surprising. This rite could also extend to a lord taking the virginity of every woman in the village. Even if they didn't want to get married, it was ridiculous. However, late Middle Age and Renaissance era texts don't clearly determine whether this practice ever occurred. Texts from 15th century Switzerland references the Lord of Mar demanding the right of the first knight or a hefty fee. So either you pay for it, or I do it. The Dois de Seigneur was depicted in Mel Gibson's Braveheart, which added to the infamy of the idea, but no physical evidence determines whether any lord actually did it, but it did technically exist. Gross. At number 10, Baby Night. I know that when someone asks a little kid what they want to be when they grow up, some of them might respond with saying something like a princess or a cowboy or a knight. But back in the medieval age, kids were really becoming knights, not just when they grew up. Knights started training when they were between the ages of 7 and 10, so their childhoods were pretty short lived. In this day and age, kids that age are starting elementary school and are still too short to ride most rides at the theme park, but back in the day, they were being trained to go off to war. Sounds like a pretty sucky situation, but it gets even worse when you realize that most of these young knights didn't even get a choice in the matter. Parents back then controlled what their kids' futures were going to look like, and there was nothing that their kids could do or say about it, so if they were to be trained as a knight and go off to war, that's exactly what was going to happen. At number 9, Squires. Now even though kids as young as 7 years old would be shipped off to train as a knight, luckily no one was going to send these kids out into battle just yet. Before they could even think about seeing the battlefield, they had to go through training. First they started off as pages. The pages mostly did menial tasks like working in the stables and serving food to the knights, but they also learned to ride horses and use a sword. A few years later, when they were about 14 years old, they would graduate to become a squire where they were assigned to a specific knight, sort of like an assistant. The squire would do some pretty menial tasks for their assigned knight, and they would clean and polish the knight's armor and sword, tend to the knight's horse, and help the knight get into their armor for battle. Most squires got through these tasks with the dream that one day they would become a knight themselves and have a squire of their own, but unfortunately in some cases some squires never became knights and they stayed a squire even past the age of 18 when most squires would become knights. Seems a little unfair to me, but I guess in that case you wouldn't be burdened with the knowledge that you could die on the battlefield since you would never make it there. Before we continue learning about medieval knights and how messed up their lives were, why not consider leaving a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and maybe also consider smashing that subscribe button as well to see more videos like this one. Number 8. Caring for Children Hey, someone had to do it. A woman's job is never done. At least that's what my mom, my aunt, uh, my grandma and pretty much every woman I've ever known has always said. Okay, sure, I was a little bit of a handful. I was loud and energetic and, and I loved to talk. Teachers always said I was a distraction in class. 
All right, maybe I was, and maybe I still am. Okay, I am. But at least the women caring for me had the modern amenities of the 21st century. A fridge full of fresh food, washing machines, cars, and a solid structure with four walls. So you can imagine if you had to deal with a kid like me back in ye olde times, just with none of the nice stuff that makes life today a lot of fun. Ye olde Chetty running amok. Oh, mother, mother. Number seven, the streets. Unusual to most, but very common to women of ye olde times. When you're a woman who's got nothing, sometimes you gotta give something. That something just so happens to be what's hiding in your pants. It's a profession that's as old as time, and it will not be going anywhere anytime soon. Women work the streets. I don't think that's anything to be ashamed of. Number six, Joan of Arc. It doesn't get more unusual than the savior of France. England and France were having a go at it if you will, which if you know history was like round 12 of 100. Anyway, it wasn't going too well for France, it was going rather poor actually. The same kind of poor I got on my report cards under the paying attention section. Oops. Then there was Joan, really a, a nobody, when one day she heard the voice from a higher power that she was to drive the English out of France. Naturally, the people around her, especially the men, scoffed at the thought of a young woman being the hero they needed. But given that they had nothing to lose, suited her up and sent her out. Plot twist, she did very well, like crazy good. The Battle of Orleans proving her grit. The English were so confused and disgruntled by a young peasant girl defeating their armies, they thought it was only proof of one thing, that she wasn't a sign of God, but rather a sign of the devil. How dare a woman beat us in, that's man stuff, you can't do that. Number five. Queen. It is unusual. Most people didn't get to be royal. I mean, think about it, seriously. Although, I certainly like to be. I can't just imagine it. King of the internet. King of the black hoodie. Nice. Or king of the Chinese buffet. My point is that while women in medieval times didn't get the respect that they deserved, and every girl does, queens just had it better. And that's unusual. The queen might not have been as well respected as the king, but compared to the peasantry, she was fed. Had four walls around her that didn't leak or wind would you know, seep through or blow down, and wasn't working herself to the grave every day to provide for a king and queen that didn't think very much about them. That's a really hard life to live. Number four, cooking. Chief, somebody had to do it. Although, there's something that tells me the food wasn't that good. This isn't exactly Gordon Ramsay's five-star cuisine. Beans, cabbage, eggs, onions, bread, and of course, beer or ale to wash it down. The peasantry just didn't have the same access to food like royalty did. Although with a list like that, it sounds like it's a fast track way to an upset stomach or some really grody gas, dude. It was women who would often be preparing those delicious dishes. Besides the hours I would spend on the commode after visiting a commoner's house from eating that, the taste is something we're talking about, I think. When you guys are cooking chicken, for example, what are your favorite recipes, spices, flavors? Let us know in the comments, I'm curious. My favorite chicken is barbecue chicken. Brush a little Diana sauce. Medieval folks just didn't have that. More upsetting than that is the lack of spices in general. While there were some, anything not local would have been crazy expensive and not available to common folks. Medieval women did the best with what they could when they had it. That's just how it goes, Chief. I talked to him, he's a chef, he said it's all right. Number three, nuns. It makes sense, honestly, becoming a woman of God was honestly a good career choice for a woman. For starters, you become a woman of God and that means you're protected under his vision. Thank you, Jeebus. And people need that back then, seriously. Secondly, it would also give you a place to live. Some nuns stayed in one town and others traveled where needed, staying in monasteries and convents where it was possible, and probably more comfortable than living in the mud and stone huts that the serf women were living in. And lastly, they got rulers and sticks, and if someone was bad, they would punish them when they misbehave. Oh, sorry sister, I didn't mean to say naughty words in the classroom. I guess you'll have to spank Chetty now, ooh. All jokes aside, this might have been one of the best things for a woman to be, besides royalty or marrying rich. It's just how the times went. Number two, landowner. I was shocked by this one too, honestly, but yes, women could own land. Sort of. It wasn't a blanket green light. It's a bit more confusing than that. Some could, some couldn't. There was a few rules here and there. They were stupid man patriarch poo poo rules, but rules nonetheless. In Normandy, for example, only men and their sons could possess land ownership. 
In the Basque region, both sons and daughters could inherit land. In England, both could, but if there were any surviving men or brothers, then they would be considered first, and not women at all sometimes. So, no, it's not as open as today, and you probably would catch some strange looks as a woman rolling up to an empty lot and staking your shovel in the ground. It makes life a lot easier if there aren't so many rules, and I know you guys agree with me at home. The less red tape, the better, right? And be nice to girls, be nice to women. Number one, artist. This one hits home. I think Chris can agree with me on this one. A lot of male artists, writers, and poets get remembered from history, but there was a few decent female ones too. We gotta give them some spotlight. Just It sucks that males get all the spotlight. To me, this makes sense. In my experience, a lot of girls I knew growing up had natural talent for arts. I remember growing up in school and art class was always one of my worst subjects. No, not because I didn't follow directions, but my art never came out the way I wanted it to. I, I didn't feel the motivation, babe. I, didn't, I couldn't see the motivation. Most of the girls in art class just passed with flying colors. No pun intended. And for writing, well, besides my dyslexia, if you looked at a paper I wrote in the sixth grade versus a girl from my classroom in the sixth grade, what's the difference? Well, you can actually read hers. I, mine are terrible. All grade school antics aside, notable artists and writers include Clerica Gouda, that's a cool name, and Hildegard of Bingen. Names you might not know, but for sure are worth a Google search. At number 10, watching consummation. Back in medieval times, depending on the century, weddings either meant a lot or meant nothing at all. If it was the early medieval age, then no one really gave a hoot about marriage, and I'll get to that later. But later in the medieval age, marriage became a holy sacrament, and this sacrament had to be consummated. On the night of the couple's wedding, they would do the good old brown chicken, brown cow, boom boom pow, <laughs> OMG wow. Which could have been a positive or negative experience, depending on circumstance, but it was also a little weird because there would be people watching it all happen. That's right guys, after the ceremony and reception, people would follow the bride and groom up to the bedroom and be like, hey Joe, grab the popcorn, we're watching the live showing of Fifty Shades of Grey. And Joe would be like, yo bet, and then that's exactly how it happened. Anyways, this was all done so that there were witnesses to the consummation, so that the marriage's validity could be backed up. So if anyone tried to deny that their marriage was legit, Joe with the popcorn would be able to back up the bride and groom and confirmed that everything happened. Kinda kinky, kinda weird. Number nine, dowries. Today's weddings are in so insanely expensive. I don't know if it's ever gonna happen for me, for that reason alone. But uh, you know, they kind of replaced the dowry altogether. But what was a dowry? It was a set of assets, money, material, goods, real estate, that would be given to the groom once the couple united. The purpose of the dowry was to entice a groom to marry the bride if he wasn't already attracted to her. A kind of, we will pay you to marry our daughter kind of vibes. But it also acts as a kind of insurance for the bride. Should the marriage end in divorce, the husband is expected to pay it back. So yes, there were indeed take backsies if things got really bad. Though considering divorce and annulments were rare and the money really never belonged to her, not the best rule to live by, but the groom would also pay something called the bride price or bride wealth. The groom was expected to pay a sum, either in assets or money, to secure a lady's hand in marriage. This implied security for the bride and their family. But yes, in both accounts, technically, a bride could be bought and sold for whatever price the family slash groom deemed appropriate. So really just a marriage pawn. Number eight, the art of dying. To see where I'm going with this, check out this pic. Why does he look so calm? He's literally being stabbed in the head and like the side and everywhere else. While in real life this wouldn't actually happen, you wouldn't be this calm if you were being killed, but this was the goal. People lived in a very pious society back in the medieval ages, and what with death looming around every corner with the Black Plague, you know, they developed a very unique idea about death called Ars Moriendi, the art of dying. The idea revolved around a good Christian death, that it should be planned and peaceful. I'm going to die on December 16th, blah, 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 whatever date. They didn't actually say that, but anyways. So as medieval people were lying on their deathbed in their castle, they were expected to receive it without despair or any kind of existential crisis. You had to take it honorably and if you didn't it was looked down on but then again you were also dead so what does that matter but it was because of this belief that even in paintings depicting gore and death the victim who was stabbed in the head always had like a calm expression was just like yeah this is fine it's a flesh wound number seven a jester versus Netflix. As soon as I said jester, you pictured a tight wearing, colorful bard with a stupid hat. 
Probably not far off, but the nobles had to entertain themselves somehow as previously mentioned. The castle would play host to loads of minstrels, jugglers and acrobats. Edward II for instance in 1306 had hundreds at his knighting celebration. But the original meaning of the jester was just simply a good storyteller. They would wander in on dark evenings and entertain the company with fancy tales, comedic and dramatic. But soon jesters became employed full time to kings and lords. Henry II had one called Roland the Musical Farter. Brain in. I wonder what he did. Every Christmas he would perform and earn a grant of the land so they were paid pretty well. He had to be wise and quick witted in order to maintain the love of their masters, however if they went too far, off with their head. Tribule, the king of France's fool, once went too far and was sentenced to execution, but he got out of it when they allowed him to choose how he would die. He simply said, old age, and he was pardoned. Again, quick witted. Number 6 Gazing out of windows Imagining a world where women are restricted from education, business, autonomy is thankfully getting harder and harder to do. But even without feminism, women still operated within the constraints of a patriarchal society in very important ways. It was their job to run the entire castle when the lord was away for instance. They weren't just staring out windows, waiting to lower their hair for a handsome suitor. Medieval noblewomen for instance had the responsibility of running the household and enforcing it. Lords were often away on Crusades, war, court, or even just dead. So it was up to the ladies to run the estate, finances, and even to defend the castle against attack. Also, if the husband was dead, many women would choose not to remarry because you had more advantages being a widow than being married. You would essentially be treated as a man, especially with, in terms of property and things like that. Religion was also incredibly important, and one of the restrictions for women at the time was that they were forbidden from touching the altar. So in order to metaphorically dance around this, they donated their clothes to the church, which would eventually be worn by the clergymen, hence they would eventually touch the altar. A very clever way of getting around this rule, but more research needs to be done about women in the medieval ages, but this is kind of what it looked like. Number 5 Shotgun Weddings Behind the closed doors of the castle walls, love lives were pretty much what you would expect them to be. Really stinky and also not about love. Marriage was politically motivated and there wasn't room for much love there. Women have women had essentially no say and both boys and girls could be married as soon as 12 to 14. However, compared to today, their ceremonies would be better compared to a shotgun wedding in Vegas than the ones we know. It would be completed in a matter of moments just by simply uttering consent. You could marry technically in the street or at dinner or at a pub or in bed after the deed is done. So because things got so confusing by the 12th century, marriage got more complicated. It was declared a holy sacrament that must be observed by God. Observed being the key word. Not only did people actually have to see people saying I do, they had to see them do the deed. The bride was carried to the bed by the family and they would wait around until the act was complete. So you know what I mean. If you were lucky enough to live in a castle, you might have had bed curtains to shield the viewing, but they, they still heard everything that was going on. Number 4 The Mystery of Ludlow Castle Beyond weird weddings, war, and strange food performances, castles contain secrets behind their walls we may never know, such as the mystery of the White Lady of Ludlow Castle. In the 12th century, the castle was home to Marion de la Bruyere, and she had a secret. She was in love with a secret suitor with whom she would sneak into the castle each night. She would lower a rope in true Rapunzel fashion to bring her love to her. But little did she know that her mysterious love was setting a trap for her. One night he left the rope below so that more men could follow up behind him and take the castle. Bereft and betrayed, Marion stabbed her lover with his own sword. She then flung herself from the castle's walls and perished on the rocks below. To this day, people have stories of seeing a woman's white figure tumbling from the castle window, trapped in the desperate circumstances of her death. Number 3 Secret Passageways If I am ever <laughs> ever in my life, able to actually afford a house. We'll see. One of the ride or die requirements is a secret passageway or to a secret library. Like both. Both would be great, but a secret library is a must. And I will never tell anyone about it, because how cool would it be if they found it themselves? Medieval castles were filled with secret passageways and alcoves designed to help facilitate escape should the need arise. In fact, it was kind of a requirement of fortifications to have one. The main secret entrance was called the Postern. It was small, therefore easy to defend, and protected by metal grates, as well as there were battlements above it. However, the entrance could be exploited if in the wrong hands. Say you have some double crossers behind your 
walls. They could help sneak in the enemy soldiers, such as the case of Corfe Castle during the siege of 1645. An officer named Colonel Pittman helped aid enemy troops in through the postern, condemning the fate of the fort. Number two, where's the loo? <laughs> there are so many reasons to be thankful for modern day plumbing, but this reason above the rest. Because of plumbing, we don't need a gong farmer. What is a gong farmer? I'm not glad you asked. In castles, bathrooms were often called gongs or loos and often overhung over the moat or onto the ground so that like whatever was happening would just drop below. There was a wooden board with a hole in it, you sat on it, did your business and got up. Simply straightforward. But sometimes the droppings fell into a cesspit like in Rochester Castle. The smell would rise up and though they didn't know about germs, they believed bad smells were unhealthy. So eventually, the pit had to be cleaned. Enter the gong farmer. This is a dirty job that even Mike Rowe would run from. They had to scoop out the stuff ferry it away and bury it. It was a dangerous job too and one poor fellow named Richard the Raker fell into one and drowned. Now that's a way to go. And last but not least, the Tower of London Zoo? The Tower of London has seen a lot of action since it was built by William the Conqueror in the 1070s. It has housed some of history's most famous political prisoners, but did you know that at one time it was kind of a zoo? From the 1200s to 1835, the tower housed an exotic assortment of wild animals. Lions, tigers, bears, oh my, but also elephants, monkeys, and polar bears. They were brought to the castle as gifts, and if you visit the attraction now, there are wire sculptures commemorating the beasts. In 1235, Henry III was given leopards, though most likely they were lions, but they were just called that, by the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II. And that's where it all began. The king decided to start a zoo at the tower, and that he did. A polar bear joined the exhibit in 1252, and then an African elephant in 1255. A special enclosure was built, but sadly the elephant died only a couple years later, which was sadly the fate of most of the animals. Except for the lions, they did pretty well. 